Hello and welcome to the 24th episode of Tailoring in Conversation. In this series, I'll be talking to tailors, cloth merchants, business owners, and other industry participants from all around the globe to gain a better insight into their worlds. If you like our channel and you like the contents, please don't forget to subscribe to support us. Now, my guest for today is Desmond Marion. Des is a bespoke tailor from West Yorkshire's Pontefract. And in this conversation for today, we're gonna to be talking about his background, factory work and more. I also have to say, if you're a sensitive person, then some parts of this conversation may offend you. So if you're okay with that, let's get going. Thank you, first of all, to, to make the time. I'm, I'm no really glad to have you here and, uh, and to chat about all things tailoring. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Des, if I, if I would ask you who you were at 10 years old, just to get an idea of, of who you were growing up, who, who would you say you were? A 10-year-old? Well, probably from five-year-old until being 15, 16, I was a kid that was army barmy, that wanted to go in the army. That was it. Mm. There was nothing else. It was everything. Out riding my bike, playing football, cricket, rugby. It was like the Olympic Games every day as a kid. Mm. Shooting guns, knives, climbing trees, making dens, making fires, getting into mischief. I came off a council estate in Leeds, a very notorious council estate, which is called the Withers, which is just up from Armley Jail. It's notorious then, and it was not, it's still notorious now. It just, mm -hmm. to be fair, it, it, not a nice place, but there's lots of places that are like that, and, you know, you sort of, you grow from that, you take away from it. The community was very strong, but it, it was flea bags and riffraff, mm -hmm. you know, it were, it were a tip, but I, I loved my childhood. I absolutely loved it. I would not change a single thing with my childhood. Mm. Did you have brothers and sisters as well? I've got an older brother um, mm. and I've got an older sister, so I'm the youngest. I'm not quite sure if I was actually wanted or not from a, right. <laughs> a point of view, but um, we were close as kids. I mean, my brother, I'm 54, my brother is 62. Mm -hmm. It might be 63. I know it sounds very vague. We don't live in each other's pockets. Um, and my sister is probably about five years older than me. She'd be coming up for 58, 59. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a gap, as you can imagine. Nobody wants to be knocking around with somebody that's potentially, you know, 10 years younger than them. That, that gap at that age is, is vast. When you're 40 and you're 50, you can close it really easily. You know, mm -hmm. when you're 15 and five, yeah, that gap is you just your planets away from each other. So right. my brother, um, I don't remember much. With we played in the street, as I say, with the council estate. So we played jumping over bloody elastic bands, jumping over people's gates, mm. silent sleeping lions, you know all that kind of stuff. Roller yeah. skates on the book down the hill. Fighting yeah. with the kids from the other estate. When I say fighting, fighting when you're seven year old didn't like fighting when you're thirty. Yeah. But you know, it would just that's that's what it was. You know, you you know the council estate. Um, we were on Armley, um, Wither Park Street. You never were, really went down to, you know, the bottom down near the church, the other side of the Catholic church. I'm Catholic, not that I'm go to church, but I did go to a Catholic school. And I was initially taught by nuns up until about being about eight years old. Mm -hmm. And that was that was brutal, to be honest, just thinking back. I remember when I left, I went back as a kid about 12. I went to see the head teacher, Sister Cecilia. And I walked mm -hmm. in and she went, what are you doing here? Get out. Mm -hmm. It was just literally, boom, that was it. You yeah. think they'd be, oh, Desmond, how are you? But mm -hmm. they were. And they were pretty, they were pretty handy in giving you a clatter. They won't, they won't shine with it. Mm -hmm. But it makes you into what you are. I don't feel, you know, I have one of them bleeding hearts. Yeah, yeah. It's what it is, you know, you just, it's what it was of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And were you, uh, were you similar to your brother and your sister in terms of personality and, and the way you were no. just kind of like, not at all? Not at all. Not at all. Um, my sister has turned out to be an academic. I mean, she's got so many letters behind her name. It's unbelievable. She's been like a professional student all her life, I think. Mm. Um, she's had a few goes at business, this, that, and the other. What she's doing, I don't know. We're not 
we, we don't speak that often, to be fair. It's one of them things. My brother had an argument with my father in the middle of the night, got in his car, went to his girlfriends in London and never came back. Mm. He, joined, he joined the fire brigade. He retired when he was 55. He lives down south. He was in Morden. He's now down in Kent. Right. So we're not, we're not similar. My brother's can be fiery. I could, to be fair, I could be a storm in any port, mm. um, very much like my father. But mm. I knocked around with my dad a lot. From, you know, I worked with him from being a young kid. So mm-hmm. the apple don't fall far from tree. Right. But I right. don't think I've got quite as many of my dad's bad habits. And I've been told a few times I'm not as aggressive as my father, which is quite mm. reaffirming. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, but no, we, we're not similar at all. We're not into similar things. When I were a kid, right. my brother, obviously I'd come home from school. My brother would be at work. This is yeah. when he was with us. Um, and he'd get 2000 AD delivered. Well, it'd come through the door. I'd get it straight away at magazine and read it. He'd go absolutely nuts. And mm. if you can imagine a young man that worked in the shipyard as a coppersmith before he became a fireman, mm. the shipyard at Goole is where he worked. Um, the built ships, it was the largest indoor port mm. in the UK, in the built ships. Very, very skilled, Mark, a coppersmith, which is pipe work and welding and all that kind of thing, soldering. Doesn't exist now, it's all that push fit crap. Yeah. And um, he'd order like little porcelain bells and this kind of stuff and have them up on shelf in bedroom. We shared a bedroom mm. and, and it was weird. And he's still got them in his house now, all like these collections of things, models and toys. Mm-hmm. He won't like, he won't, you know, not at all, just chalk and cheese. But he's done well, don't get me wrong. You know, he's done very well. His missus mm-hmm. worked for a lot of years and they're both retired now. And But he's a bit of a square box in a square box in a square box. Right, right. It's me, you say to me, right, can we get off of that? I'd be like, yeah, let's jump it. He'd be like, yeah. mm, hang on a minute. You know, I'm not <laughs> sure about it. Let's just, right. can we? Oh, no, I'll, I'll walk around. Come on, get yeah. over it. You know? mm-hmm. So, no, he, he isn't like me at all. And my sister... She's got a chip on her. She always has. Right, but, right. So, what know, did your parents do? What were what was their profession or their their daily duties or work or jobs or things like that? Oh, for my brother and sister. Your parents. Oh, my, my well, both of them worked for Burton's, which was the world's largest merchant tailors. But right. this was in the day when Burton's were very good quality. To be fair, for a factory made suit, my father wasn't a tailor; he was an engineer. So mm-hmm. what he, a sewing machine engineer. So he actually, he's actually partly responsible for the demise of bespoke tailoring, believe it or not, because he developed machinery that replicated hand sewing in the factories. So me and my dad ended up like two steam trains on the same track. We were like this. We we're yeah, always putting yeah. it. So my dad, that was my dad, very, very skilled, very well respected. And bear in mind, we're talking numbers game, Burton's Hudson Road, you know, mm. it did 30,000 30, soups a week. Mm. There was 10,000 staff in Burton's at Hudson Road. There were 700 cutters. Wow. This is the scale of one factory. And my mother also worked at Burton's, but she was a machinist. So, mm-hmm. But she was what was known as a utility hand. She could do all the jobs. It was way before automation. It was all flatbed machines. There might be a zigzag. There might be a walking foot machine, whatever. But she was a utility hand, so she could do all the jobs across trousers and coat, even though mm-hmm. primarily she became really uh, more involved with the trouser making in the factory. And she ended up actually running the training school um, right. at, at Gould. Burton's had their own training schools and the, mm-hmm. the girls, particularly the machinists, and they were, they were all girls. <coughs> then. So yeah, I just have to talk as I see it. I add into mm-hmm. all this new age crap, it's what it is. Mm-hmm. They were all girls, they were all women, it was a woman's job. <clears throat> Um, they'd get, I think they'd get about two weeks training and if they want up to snuff boom, big Spanish archer you and out the door mate mm-hmm. so it was you know they were on point but it's production you've got to turn out in any job doesn't matter what it is whether you're making yeah. Italy Winks cars or whatever if you're not up to snuff mm-hmm. you're not part of that team you're out the door but my yeah. father is a, but obviously with him developing machinery and fixing it, mending it, which were his daily job. So he oversaw a team of, I don't know how many, mechanics, sewing machine mechanics and boiler engineers, plant workers. You've got to remember, you know, it's not just machine, it's pressing mm-hmm. equipment. Well, 
he, he knew his way around the garment. There was no way around mm -hmm. it. He was very skilled, very, very well respected, very well respected. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the people we used to make for, and I used to go and, well, they, they were all at our factory at Christmas, Christmas party, what hottest ticket around, you know, yeah. 200 odd women, you know, it were yeah. all the reps there, they all turn up like month before. Oh, do you need help? You know, give me all this free crap and stuff that they do, because they want an invite to Christmas party. But mm -hmm. it was very well respected and he, he, he knew what he was doing. So one question I have uh, about the work that your father did, um, what what sort of a perspective did he have towards the the development of machines that of which I, I assume he he knew that at some point would replace, for example, mm. hand sewing and things like that. How was his perspective on that? How was did was he I, concerned with things or what was it like? It's a job. You know, mm. resurrection topics like, oh, you know, you, you can be that one soldier that says, no, I'm not doing it. And you end up against a brick wall and shop. That's the extreme of it. It's a job. You yeah. just get on with it. You might not like it. You're not there to like it. You're there to take a wage. That's been employed, unfortunately. So it, yeah. I don't think he had any concern about it. I think all he was bothered about was, you know, Monday to Friday, then getting out, getting on the piss, going fishing mm -hmm. and playing dominoes with his mates, which is what he did every weekend. So I don't think he really... Yeah, it was really yeah, bothered. Yeah. He never had any regrets, never said anything like that to me. Um, mm -hmm. He had regrets when he sold the factory that he didn't give me some bits that I asked for out of the factory. He wanted to make me pay for them and I couldn't afford to buy them. Right. And he said, I really wish he gave you them because it would have helped you a lot more. You'd have yeah. moved on a lot. He did. <clears throat> but that's back. I, just incidentally, I'm still back end of this cold. Mm -hmm. it takes me ages to shift it I'm on a bloody autoimmune injection man. I believe it or not I'm as strong as a bull but I'm in that highly vulnerable category because I'm on an autoimmune injection so I've had this cold for about three weeks and it's a twat being totally mm -hmm. honest so my yeah. voice sounds a bit <clears throat> and that's what it is you can obviously mm -hmm. edit that bit <laughs> yeah, yeah sure thing so okay um, when when did you start to 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 at least feel some sort of an attraction towards sewing things, making things, because obviously you're surrounded with people who make things. And then yeah. you you then try to navigate your way through that. Uh, who who guided you? What guided you? How did the story of Desmond into tailoring unfold? Well, I mean, it started before before my father and mother because my, my grandmother and my nan actually worked at Burton's before my father. So that they've both mm -hmm. been there 50, 50 years each, 50 years it's unbelievable nowadays to think somebody's staying in a job for 50 years those days are yeah. way gone yeah. but I had no no inclination for it whatsoever my path was planned it was I knew what I was going to do I left school I got on the new scheme which was the YTS scheme youth training scheme it paid 25 quid a week and I'd got a job in Google where we lived, well, we lived just outside Gould in a village called Hook, opposite the pub, very conveniently for my father. Mm -hmm. And I got a job in a, a shop that was split in two halves. Mm -hmm. One half was firearms, guns, and the other side was bikes, push bikes. Ghoul is known as Little Holland because it's as flat as a far. Everybody cycles. Well, they did. Right. They, don't, right. they don't now. They all get in cars and they're all 35 stone. But everybody cycled. It was known as Little Holland because it was mm. that many bicycles. So I'd got a job primarily in, in this shop and I wasn't bothered in the bikes, but of course I knew bikes. I'd had a bike from being a young kid, and, you know, so I could repair it. I was bothered in the gun side and I wanted to go in the army, in the Ordnance Corps, which incidentally was my father's old regiment in 58 when he was in national service to become an armourer. Um, and the guy of the shop, Don Gladen, who actually was my school friend's uncle, a very good school friend's uncle, he, he had to go into the infirmary for a heart bypass and he died on the table. So the shop was sold, closed, I was out on my ear and it literally happened that quick. My dad just said, come in, come in to work and help us out while you sort yourself out. So I was like, oh, fucking hell, all right, yeah. <laughs> so I went into, I'd been running in and out of the factories for years, but I didn't want to do it. It wasn't what I wanted to do. So it wasn't a case that I didn't, you know, it was alien. I knew the environment and everything, but I'd not worked in it. I'd only helped out during the school holidays, putting belts in trousers and stuff like that. 
mm-hmm. and in the dispatch general bits of crap. But I liked the crack of it even then. But I was still with the army. But then I said, Don died out of work. My dad said, come in and help out. And that were it. Boom. Mm-hmm. 14 years later until the factory sold, I was I was in. But I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I loved the crack. I loved the hub hub. I loved mm. the buzz. I loved being around women. There was 220 machinists and and 12 men, cutters, mm. and one one designer who might have been floated either way, to be fair. But I loved it. I loved the crack. And they were old school, hardcore. You'd walk up the production line with a big box of hangers on my shoulder and they'd be like, how big's your cock? Get your pants out. Show us your knob. Yeah. It was just all that. It was... Yeah. And I was <laughs> Get your tits out first, you know. It was just, I loved it. It was just Did that it remind camp- you of, of atmospheres within the army, kind of like uh, boys getting on each other's nerves and testing each other out? Yeah, well, well, I've been an army cadet at that point since I was 13, so I was still an army cadet when I was working at my dad's. Yeah. So it didn't really bother me, but there was no girls in the army cadets then, and there was no... Um, women instructors there was later on but Mm -hmm. I liked it it, I don't know I just I just liked it so I've always been quite comfortable around women because I've been around them from a really early age but some of them I mean they was they'd knock you out they'd spark you you would not you know Gina that would you know throwing a Hoffman press lid around all day and a you know trouser block bang and I mean doing like 500 pairs a day you wouldn't mess with her now she'd spark you straight out. So mm. the other side of it, and then there were girls that were all in full trawling gear, stockings, high heels, you know, the lot. It was, mm. and most of the cutters were all having affairs. Yeah. It was, oh man, it was an eye opener. It was, but it was brilliant. I loved it. I loved it. Mm. So I ended up there just by a series of misfortunes, mm. essentially. But once I were in there, if I put my mind to anything, I'm like, right, I've got to work out how to do this, and I've got to. I've got to, I've got to give it my best. I might not always achieve, but mm-hmm. if I if I know I give it my best, then I'm honest to myself, and that's mm-hmm. how I've always been. So I thought, right, I'll have a proper go at it. But I was just being a dog's body resident. I wasn't doing anything specific. I was literally, mm-hmm. and we, you know, we were making three and a half thousand suits a week. So the amount yeah. of cloth that came or came in came in a container mm-hmm. on the back of a wagon, you know, the big the big hundred and eighty rolls of cloth, full pieces, full pieces. Yeah, Maybe two of them a day, so mm-hmm. I'd be humping all them out, and that you know them things, you know, they weigh like eighty, ninety pounds. Yeah. Some of them there were only me that could lift them. Some of the men I worked with were seventy odd year old; they couldn't lift them. So I was like this bleeding crane, you know, the humper and bumper shifting stuff all over, yeah. and cleaning trolley wheels, taking work to girls, mm-hmm. fetching this, fetching that, and then eventually my dad asked me if I wanted to take it seriously, and did I want to? you know, to sort of do it properly. So I went from right. being a dog's started training. Mm. So I'm curious to know, because you said that you you were trying to do it well, and at some point you were formally asked to, you know, do you want to take this seriously? So my question is, for someone who, as you say, got there because of a series of misfortunes, mm. what, made, what made you actually not do the opposite and just kind of like, you know, mess around and just be like yeah whatever it's not what i want to do anyway you know my dad is there you know my mom is there so i could do whatever yeah. i want what made you take that work so seriously if it wasn't something that you actively went towards well i mean incidentally even though my father was a third owner he didn't own all the factory he was one third owner there was three partners <clears throat> i was lower than a snake's torso i got nothing i didn't get any special treatment Mm. I still had to pay for toast on a morning, which was eight pence a slice. I mm. got nothing. And if anything, I got a lot of shit. And I got a lot yeah. of shit from cutters that didn't have the balls to brass my dad out. And they'd brass this 16-year-old kid out. Now, I never realised it at the time. And I ended up having quite a few run-ins with him later saying, you know, what the fuck are you telling me for? Go tell my dad. It's not my problem. Yeah. I'm not on it. I'm employed like you. I'm getting mm. the same money as you. So mm. it became a real bane for me, to be fair. Mm. But it was just the fact that um, I liked it. I really liked it. And I ended up getting involved with a girl. I ended up getting her pregnant and got married. So I was married before I was 18. Right. So I needed to work. I needed right. to work. 
So wow. I was married at 17 and eight months. I was married. So, wow. and I ended up married for 25 years with her. And mm. to be honest, I should have needed it after 12 months, but I didn't. That's how stubborn I am. But anyway, that's water under the bridge. So responsibility became a need. It became a must. I needed a job. But it wasn't a case that I thought it was second, um, second, you know, second rate. Mm. I was still an army cadet when I was married, but then I became an army cadet instructor. So I was sort of double hatting. I was, mm. I had a job. I had a wage, then I'd go away on a weekend, do me a bit of soldiering. I eventually joined the TA as well after that. Mm. And I looked at joining the army regular and my father taught me out of it. My missus wasn't keen and that was a big mistake. I should have blown it all off then and done it. Because to be fair, I, I still feel as it's unfinished business and I'm, I'm too mm. old. It's obviously not going to happen now. But it was, again, it was need. As I say, I got my ex-wife pregnant and I needed a job. It, you know, there was no way I was going to be out of work. So I was like, right, okay, we need to take this seriously. But I liked it. As I say, I liked the factory. I liked the crack. Mm-hmm. I found it. I found I didn't find it hard. Mm-hmm. I found it quite e- quite easy. The politics annoyed me sometimes, obviously. And mm-hmm. when you work for your father and you're on the shop floor and you hear it, you know, snide remarks and shit, it's hard. You've got to put it to the back of your mind because you can fall out with people really easily. Mm-hmm. And people are bitter, as you know. People are bitter. There's not no two ways about it, especially when you employ people. You could give them a gold bar at Christmas and it still won't be enough. So mm-hmm. there were bits that annoyed me. But overall, the, the, the good really outweighed the bad. I loved, you know, working with the fellas and that and the tales and, mm-hmm. you know, when they were at Burton's. And as I say, it was just unbelievable. The stuff they used to get up to, it was just, it was great. I, I never realised that I... Probably at my age, I'm probably one of the last that's going to see it. I don't think there'll be anybody your age that sees the kind of production I've seen. You know, if mm-hmm. you think about it, 14 years, three and a half thousand suits a week, and we were only small. So mm-hmm. I've seen, through my father's factory, best part of two million suits. Wow. Yeah. That's, you when you put it into that scale, that's, yeah, and yeah. Some, something you can't buy is experience, and you get experience from seeing volume mm-hmm. and numbers whatever yeah. level you're at. Yeah, yeah. So so two, two questions. The question number one is, how much of the factory work that you have seen there in that time had handwork involved? And then the second question is, did you get your ma- the, the majority part of your training in that factory or was that somewhere else? No, I got all my training primarily in the factory because right. we, had, we had girls that bear in mind that, well, some of the cutters I worked with served in the Second World War. Right, so right. this was way before fusible. So we started out with canvas garments. We started mm-hmm. out with girls that did hand felling, hand buttonholes. Yeah. And then obviously they retired. We got new girls in. Fusible was the thing when I started, but we still did canvas garments as well and full mm-hmm. open coat garments. So there was, there was two lines. There was a coat line, a trouser line, and then there were specials. Mm-hmm. And all the utility hands did all the specials. And we used to make for other people. I never realised at the time that we'd, we'd do measure work that were for other small independent tailors. Mm-hmm. So they'd send work into us and it'd be bespoke garments. Mm. So we had everything going on there. So I was lucky that I, I saw it all, but I I had to fight to be shown it all and to, mm-hmm. to, to get to understand it. But when you're around it all the time and there was no... You know, there was, you know, if you wanted to go and use a machine at lunchtime, you could go and use a machine. Anybody could do all they wanted in your own time. Mm-hmm. So, and when you're moving around, you see people out there doing things, and you pick it up, and you think, "Oh, I'll have a go at that." And of course, yeah. then I had a machine at home, and you start pissing around by yourself, and then you start mm-hmm. honing and developing your skills. And you know, even though I've seen all these garments, I don't consider myself a finished product in any way, shape, or form. I don't think many people do in anything. There's always mm-hmm. something. That you know, there's always something you're like, mm, how can I get that yeah. thinner? Can yeah. I get that better? Oh, how, mm, uh, can I press that this way? That was But trust me, I've seen so many garments that mm-hmm. pff, it's eye-watering. It's eye-watering. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. everything I did was in house, was trained in-house. But mm-hmm. I then spoke to my father, I think I'd be about 28, 27, mm-hmm. 20. And I said, look, I need to go to college. He says, what for? I says, well, I need a paper qualification. I said, if this place closes, my dad turned around and went, you must be fucking mad. 
do you think this place is ever going to close? And I went, I don't know. He says, but I haven't actually got any paper qualifications as such. Mm. So he says, oh, Jesus, right, okay. So they sent me to Leeds College of Art and Design. Well, it, was, it wasn't called that then. It was called the Jacob Kramer College. Right. <clears throat> I used to go there one day a week, which was on a Wednesday. Mm. But I learned really quick that I knew, without being big-headed, I knew more than every tutor in that place apart from one. And his name was Peter Quirk, and he was typical Jewish tailor, old school, proper old school, lovely, lovely man. The most round back I've never seen in my life. <laughs> and five foot two, stereotypical, quite feminine with it as well, but a lovely fella. So what was his main but domain? He did pattern drafting. Right, right. But you wanted to know it, he knew it. You had a question, he knew it. It, it, it was amazing. It, he had um, he had a piece of cloth on the wall on the on the board, and he'd do he'd draw full scale patterns on it, quarter scale, whatever. It, it, it was amazing. It, you you wanted a, you wanted a hood cut with a hood boom, it was up there. You wanted an Angus, you know Sherlock Holmes job bang. Yeah. He'd done it, and you know he was he was amazing. So that was on the morning. So. Mm. I had no car, incidentally. I used to have to wait for my dad to turn up with second car. Then I'd jump in car and drive to Leeds from Donny. And my mate worked for an insurance company in Leeds. So on the morning, I'd go to college. It started at nine o'clock. Bear in mind, we started working factory at seven. So it would, mm. would doddle. And then in the afternoon was actual practical work. So mm. we did the usual thing. You started with trousers, then a waistcoat. Or it might have been a waistcoat, then trousers, then a coat. And I was like, I don't need this lot. I know... I know more than you. But actually, my tutor was actually admitted in because they had a pressing room. And on a Friday was the only time they turned the boilers on because it had a big boiler. And they had three or four Hoffman presses in with four inch steam pipes. And they actually used to come to me and say, Before you go, will you press all the coats off for us? I was like, Yes, yeah, sweet. You'll give me my mark for afternoon, my tick. Yeah. So come 12 o'clock, I'd be out in the last round leads with my mate from work, from his, from his, uh, insurance job and would be drunk as skunks and getting home was another tale but I'm not going to divulge anything other than that sure <clears throat> so I only did the morning but I always got my mark and I was past everything because <laughs> and when I had to submit the work I just submitted it because it was there you know I could do it it was mm -hmm. no drama at all but the pattern drafting was I really enjoyed that with Peter mm -hmm. And it was very good, but it, it don't float me boat. There's a lot said about pattern cutting and stuff. Personally, I think it's overrated mm -hmm. cutting. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's very low. It's not that yeah. skilled to do. It, right, to be honest, right. in my opinion, if you mm -hmm. if you have confidence, you see, I've seen so many stuff cut. I could probably freehand a pattern. I mean, proper freehand, not that rock of ice shit, which is guessing with a few cardinal points. Right. I mean, right. proper. Yeah. You know, so, actually, you're talking about this. I'm so I'm so interested in this. Because uh, I also believe that one could reach a stage where you just like you say completely freehand the pattern. Now, yeah. a question, uh, Des: What would you say someone has to know to be able to completely freehand the pattern? Well, you've you've got to have seen you've got to have seen enough of it to know what it looks like. Firstly, mm, you've got lots to of have references. Your You've got to have that eye. You've got to understand the proportion as well. You could freehand a pattern and it could look right, but everything would just be completely wrong. It'd be all the wrong. Everything would be in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, a, there's an old phrase, as you know, you, you can have a garment full to size, but it doesn't mean it's going to fit because all the mm -hmm. size is in the wrong place, whether yeah. it's horizontal or vertical. But yeah. when you honestly, when you've seen the numbers I have, it... it Mm. And particularly with bespoke, you know, you, you you have the fitting which makes it safe for everybody. And there's always yeah. a tweak here. I don't believe these people that say they can cut it without a fitting. Well, yeah, you'll probably find a fault somewhere with fit. But then again, beauty's in the eye of beholder. The mm. fit is dictated by what you perceive as a good fit and what mm. your customer yeah. thinks is happy. So yeah. what you think acceptable, I might not, and vice versa. And mm. you can chase that little bit to nth degree, but it's always at the sacrifice or something else there's always a cut off point unless mm. you've got the wealth of Jesus and you don't need the money and you're doing it for a complete hobby then yeah, fine yeah. Otherwise, it's always a cut off point because you're just like can't put any more time into it it's we're where we're at and you're always 
95, 98% happy with every garment. You're never 100% happy. I put this coat on this morning. I'm like, I love this. It looks great. But trust me, the summer, because I've seen, as soon as I put it on, I'm like, shit. (laughs) You know, there's something. Nobody else Mm. can see it, but you know it's there. Yeah, yeah. No many trades that are like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. And so you, the numbers you you say, I I still cannot visualize how many garments that would be like in volume. But how, which parts were were purely done by hand, except for the <coughs> for some of the obvious things? But what was the main well, handwork department in in that factory? We, well, we eventually went to a completely engineered garment. So there was, right. they, it ended up where there was no no handwork in them. There was very little, maybe the back of the collar tabs, and that was it. Everything mm-hmm. else was just mach- engineered out. It was just machined out. There were mm-hmm. canvas went, three quarter canvas went, half canvas came in. That's mm-hmm. really where we stopped at. Fused front, half canvas. Mm-hmm. So all the handwork went. The girls that had the skills, it had gone. Mm-hmm. But that's not that wasn't our fault. We were CMT. We want our own label. So mm-hmm. we made for Burton's, we made for Max and Spencer's, British Home Store, St. Michael. St. Michael was a leg of Max and Spencer's. We also made for Centaur, but we also made for Van Gilds, Crombie, Berwin and Berwin, Givenchy, Yves Saint Laurent. So mm. we had lots of different, but there was no difference in the make and the quality. The only difference in the end product was the cloth was slightly better quality on the high end stuff and it had a little bit more details but other than that trust me Reza they went down that same production line the only defining difference at the end with the price was the label that went into the garment but yeah. we ended up we ended up fully engineered so the skills mm-hmm. went the girls you know the girls that had these skills they'd, they'd gone they were retiring you know they were mm-hmm. bloody 70 odd year old you know that mm-hmm. worked six years in a factory yeah they died you know there was mm-hmm. a lot of girls that died cancer you know i still get a message now and again oh do you know jenny's dead i'm like mm, no you know there's lots of them that have died of cancer now i don't know if that's linked back to working in a factory with asbestos lagging around pipes or anything but right the the skills were going and but it wasn't us that dictated it it was the buyers so the buyers mm-hmm. would say look we're gonna we're gonna pay you this for a garment which i wasn't privy to but you could see it were just getting de-skilled and de-skilled and de-skilled. And the factory just ended up becoming more and more automated. So it, it became with auto jigs. So, right, you know, right. you'd, have, you'd have girls that were just loaders. They were just called mm. loaders. So all it was, they'd just pick a four part up, they'd pick a facing up, they'd stick it onto a jig that's got all the raised bits to put these into the lapel tips perfectly. They'd clamp it down, close another clamp on top of it, stick it into a machine, press the mm-hmm. pedal, fire and forget they'd have three machines that's one mm. turn around that's sewing while they're loading another jig on that machine and then right. same again on this the trousers just <clears throat> you know there was a carousel of overlockers mm. all mm. worked on light sensors it you the girl would just feed the first element of a trouser in machine and take it sew around it is it sewing around she's loading another so the, mm. you know this girl were walking clockwise or anti-clockwise all day long you know for 10 hours Mm-hmm. So it became just a case of a lot of the girls just became loaders and it just became more and more automated. The pressing became less. All the mm-hmm. Hoffman presses went, the old-fashioned double-leggers, the J1, the chest blockers, the nip and drape machines. They all went. We got automatic French ones in from, uh, sorry, Italian ones, MacP, which mm-hmm. were all carousels and stuff and steam dollies that they put on and it blew it from the outside. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, it just changed, but that was mm-hmm. that's unfortunately that is the wholesale market. The wholesale market is quality low and price cheap in anything. Mm. Yes, yeah, so yeah, I agree, man. It just agree. went. It just went. And to be fair, you know, the factory, the scale just wasn't there. Obviously, people lifestyles were changing. Sportswear were a big thing. Folk mm-hmm. didn't wear suits. They don't now, for Christ's sake. Everybody's cutting around in joggers and trainers. You yeah, know, I yeah, put yeah. trainers on when I'm going running. It's what they're for. They're not for disco dancing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, let's go at nightclub in these. And I'll be like, what twat let you in and started this <laughs> off? 
You know, it is not that long ago. If you look at all fours from 50s, every man to his tee had a suit on and wore a hat. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it makes things better, but at least they have that, you know, get dressed up a little bit occasionally. Yeah. yeah it I'm might sure. have been twice a week. Yeah. But yeah. His clothing has just become so cheap. Yeah, and yeah, it defines the rhythm in a very different way nowadays. It, it, it's true. I see the same things as you say, you know, walking outside and you think someone's doing some activity, but they're dressed as if they are about to do something else. And yeah, and yeah, it's, exactly. it's it's very practical, I guess, for, for, for various reasons. It's simple, easy, you know, not, not enough time in the day. So let's just choose the most easy thing to yeah. wear. Uh, yeah. But it, it does reflect a, a different time. Very, very. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, look, I have one for looking back. Incidentally, you know, the past is gone. You can't ever get it back. You mm -hmm. know, when this interview is done, it's done. You can't, you can't do anything about it. It's done. So I'm not one mm -hmm. for harking back. And I'm not saying they were better times, but people just seem to get dressed up. You know, I went to a boxing match at Leeds United at the banquet in Sweet a couple of yeah. years ago. Black tie. Yeah. Of course, I get my DJ on, boom, look the business, walked yeah. into my local loser, I'm going with pub landlord, get to yeah. do the amount of people that haven't even got a DJ on, and I mean, let alone, they've rocked up in jeans, brown mm -hmm. shoes and a t-shirt, and the, you've prepaid. Now, personally, if that were my venue at the door, I'd be like, door staff, do not let anybody in that's black tie, they were told it's black tie, mm -hmm. but they let them in. So if we're going to not stick by the rules of these things, then it's just mm -hmm. going to keep going as it is yeah 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 that is true that is true um des who i wanted to ask you who did most of the engineering in the factory who were the engineers what was their background what were they actually doing how what dad, skills did they have your dad it was my dad my dad was on the shop floor still so it wasn't my dad was never up in the office obviously in the boardroom he used to go up there for his lunch his break and his lunch mm -hmm. where he'd get the and toast on the morning and then he'd have a salad chicken salad on the on a on a lunchtime and right. every Thursday the factory had fish and chips, which you had to buy yourself. So local mm -hmm. chip, you always got a great order on a Thursday. But there was my father and then there was three other sewing machine mechanics. One of them had two of them had come from Burton's with him that were his former trainees, former apprentices, and the other mm -hmm. one were brought in from the ghoul factory. So there was four of them on the floor, but they were like they never stopped. They were like a bloody bee around a flower all day long. Girls shouting right. out, you can you know, as I say, you're on production and we were on bonus. So your mm -hmm. flat rate was that. And then if they overproduced, the whole factory as a unit got a bonus, not individual girls. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the I don't know if I, if I just say, look, the courtroom had to do three and a half thousand coats a week as standard and the trouser room had to do three and a half thousand trousers a week. Mm -hmm. If they did four thousand and three, you know, three thousand seven fifty, then there was a bonus paid to everybody in the factory. And that right. bonus was announced over the tannoid. In them days, we worked five days, Monday to Friday. Mm -hmm. It was announced, all factory were like, yay, you know, like 20 yeah. quid bonus. Yeah. So the mechanics, you can imagine when a machine down, the girls would be shouting, Terry, Brian, yeah. <laughs> Gina, you know, yeah. Come, yeah. you know, so Gina, so what it was, the machines are just flat out all day, boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. And what about the garments? Who, who designed the, engin the engineering of the garments? Well, the buyers had come in, they'd mm -hmm. obviously give us spec sheets, they'd have an idea on what they want, but the buyers in those days, they were all, they knew the job. They, they, right. they knew how to put and make the garment. They're not mm -hmm. like these green boats today that get on a CAD and press a button. You'd be like, well, show me how to do it on a pattern. They'd be like, yep, sure, boom, no yeah. problem. How do we get this thing? And they'd be down on the shop floor on the machine showing you. So they were good at what they did. Uh, I mean, Jim Kilroy was from Centaur, you know, he was a former cutter at Burton's and he was really good. And there was, uh, I can't remember all the names, I mean, it's been close since 96, but they were good at what they did. So they knew it. So they'd come in also with a spec sheet and say, right, well, what, 10,000 of these, whatever. And we had two full-time designers. And bear in mind, everything we did was on CAD, hard CAD. It wasn't, we didn't have CAD. We didn't have no computers. Everything was hard CAD. So we had a full pattern room. And the pattern room was unbelievable. And I mean, mm. I've got photographs of my kids when they were nippers in my back garden at Donny, when my dad's factory closed on the massive pile of patterns you've seen in your life, burning them. Oh, man. Cleared my loft out. But we filled, we, we filled a full-size skip just with 
hard card patterns that came. So we had patterns for every figuration you can imagine in every size that went from 36 regular up mm -hmm. to 56 regular. We had it in regular, short, long, extra long, stout, corpulent, the lot. Mm -hmm. across sports, trousers, waistcoats, overcoats, really obscure patterns. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the patterns came from Burton's when they closed, just went in and just got them. Right. Went through the factory with my dad at Doncaster when that closed. There was 700 machinists at that one in Doncaster, mm -hmm. which is where um, Janet and Eddie came from, the other two business partners. So my dad went in, cleared it out, because he still had access. He was still employed by Burton's then, because he was still the mechanic for um, Gisborough, Ghoul, Doncaster had just closed, Leeds had uh, closed. And I think they had a factory in Marseille in France. Not sure. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. So all the patterns, we did everything in hard card, all on proper card, not that crappy card, really. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I photographed my kids on top of the pile before I burnt it, and I'm like, <sighs> now. Yeah, but yeah. at the time, it was surplus to requirements. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can imagine I just, that. don't realise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who were the, who, uh, well, where were the, the cutters? Design, Sorry? The design, the designer, who were the pattern designers. The, yeah. the, main pa the main pattern designer when I started was a guy called Arthur Chappell, mm -hmm. uh, C H A double P E double L. Mm -hmm. in a, a big, big, tall man, most placid mm -hmm. man I've ever met in my life. And it was always like this. <laughs> and I mean, always, always, never, never. Really gently spoken. But it turned out Arthur had been, you know, these old federation, tailor federations and pattern thingies. He'd been yeah. the head on, turns out, at Arthur. Mm. So there was lots of, like, old photos of him, black and white photos stood at the side of a BAOC aeroplane, you know what I mean, on tarmac somewhere abroad. Arthur mm. was amazing. Um, and then we had um, uh, Jack, oh, my God, Jack Goodall, who mm -hmm. is from, who's from Leeds, and actually, I still see Jack occasionally because the boozer, the, the, the place we used to live, Rothwell, we only moved to Pontefract a couple of years ago. My local, they had a tailor's at back of it. And his son, man, but the military tailors, they don't do civilian work, the, the military tailors, they fuse it all, which is fine. And Jack still goes in and helps out. So I used to call in occasionally before I go to a pub and go in and see him. And so I've seen yeah. Jack with him, you know, a few times over the last since factory closed in 96. Mm. Um, but he's knocking on, he, he's, he was the same age as my dad, my dad died at 72 years old, and my dad's been dead 11 years, so Jack will be 83, 84, he might be a year older, but I think they've got the same birthday, he might be a year older. But um, but yeah, there was Jack, Jack nowhere near as good as Arthur, nowhere near as good. And he, 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 I'm sure he were always on pop, you know, a bottle of vodka. Girls used to say, oh Jack, again you know and then there was another girl that um that worked with jack called amanda farmer she just mm. came to us she was actually she had her own business and i was questioning people that have their own business and go and work for somebody else because i thought well i know what i'm getting paid and you won't get paid much more than me so i'm like she can't be that good that's successful so she was one of them and so she went under jack's wing mm. um amanda farmer she was a nice girl but she didn't have a fucking clue, you know. She came from laundry and men's tailoring. I think because the wage were probably so crap, they couldn't find anybody that had the skills. Mm -hmm. I remember when Arthur retired, I actually went into town with my dad to Bell Brothers to buy him a retirement gift, and we bought him a clock, a little carriage clock, it was about 250 quid, and I was thinking, I know for a fact his brother's just retired from British Oxygen Company, and he's got about 50 grand payoff. Mm -hmm. This is not going to go down well, but that were what it was, you know, as I say, mm. staff were, mm. 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 you know, they were all driving around in S-class Mercs and, you mm. know, I'm still on Shanks's pony on foot on my bike. Yeah. <clears throat> right, 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 right. Mm. Mm. Arthur was very, very good. Amazing. So they mm. draft an initial pattern from whatever mm. they wanted and then they'd grade it all up. They'd grade mm. it up. He'd then pass it. Amanda actually worked with Arthur for a little while. He'd then pass it to Amanda. She'd spike it off each size mm -hmm. and then cut them out. Hard card. Then they'd come down mm -hmm. to us. And that were it. Where but we eventually, we eventually, mm -hmm. um, we eventually got a photocopier for right. full width 
which was 180 centimetres long. Mm -hmm. And my mate, Darren Barker, we used to call him Barker the Marker, obviously. He used to mark all the lazy. So on a sheet of paper, because of course we're cutting volume, so you'd be cutting 60 pairs deep with an Eastman cutting knife and then onto a van knife or whatever. The measure work was obviously, that was just declining. It became more of a bind than anything. Um, Darren marked mark them in on a master copy paper. Massive table, you know, 20 metres long and three metres wide. He'd mark it all in with the hard, mm -hmm. hard patterns to whatever size they wanted. So you'd have, you'd have 12 suits. 12 suits on one layer, 12 coats, mm. and you'd have trousers separate. You'd be cutting five or 600 a time, and you'd, you'd mm. be doing that, you know, numerous times a day, bundles yeah. and bundles of work all over. And we had a photocopier, you'd put it, and it'd run on ammonia, because I remember there was a right stink with that. So mm. in health and safety, trust me, didn't exist. You know, a 50-gallon drum of ammonia with an open lid, Get in there, Des, and use that machine. So you'd put the master copy in mm. and it'd have fluorescent tubes and it, you'd roll it onto an aluminium bloody thing and then the, the photocopy one would come out of the side and you're in there and your face, you'd be absolutely streaming and you'd be... <laughs> <laughs> it would unbelievable. Some of the cutters refused to go in and they'd been to the library in them days. The internet didn't exist and gone. Ammonia is an extremely hazardous thing if you'd have to say <laughs> You know, rape. Everybody, in fact, he could smell it. it what it was, you just got the job done. You know, my dad would be like, Ray, piss off. You know, yeah, yeah, he was yeah. so militant with Ray. Amazing cutter, but militant. I was communist out and out, but what a cutter he was. So we eventually went on to marking stuff. Mm. And and even in those days, you know, we'd have we'd have patterns that had been made you know, years before. So we were like, well, we ain't got enough room in pattern room. So, right, skip all that lot. Boom. Mm. You know, it it was always a big biking funeral every couple of months, the summer. Yeah. You know, just yeah. a bit of yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was... But where I would liked you say, it. Where would you say the, 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 the knowledge came from? Like, where, where did the cutters get their knowledge from? Where did the tailors get their knowledge from? Like, the initial ones, not the ones after three generations, but the, the yeah. original establishment. Everybody that worked there to a man and woman had come from Burton's. Right. And bear in, mind, bear in mind, Burton's cutters all had to go through the cutting school. And as I say, the factory at Doncaster had 200 and odd cutters. Mm -hmm. And the factory at Leeds had 700 and odd. The one at Goole had 200 and odd. Bear in mind, everything Burton's did, more or less, was measure cutting and bespoke. Mm -hmm. It wasn't volume. Everything was measure cutting. Mm -hmm. and they had, to, they, had to, they had to do I think the minimum was 12 a day but not cutting like cutters do now when they cut out they cut everything so they cut all the jets they cut all the flaps cut the facings top collar right. the under collar right. lining trim the lock 12 a day is what they had to do uh -huh. Uh -huh. I tell you now that takes some doing yes it so does they, block pattern, they get a block pattern then they'd have to manipulate it for the figuration and the size etc 12 a day was the minimum what they had to do every day so all the cutters had, were previous from Burton's and all the girls were from Burton's every one of them the factory mm -hmm. started with 50 they handpicked 50 out of the 600 and they picked mm -hmm. the fifth, best 50 girls but the factory moved so quick within 12 months they doubled in size mm -hmm. so they went to 100 and then the year after they doubled again they went to 200 it moved really quick because mm -hmm. those volumes were still there they're not, they're not those volumes in the UK they don't exist just don't mm -hmm. exist Mm -hmm. So all the skills came from Burton's. And the, the best cutter I've ever seen is, is Ray Gork, Roger. And I mean, and I've been on Savile Row. I applied for a job at Henry Pools. I've been in and out of their work rooms. The best I've seen anywhere is Ray Gork, Roger. And he was unbelievable. He came from a factory in Bradford before Burton's. Um, mm -hmm. And Ray would probably be the 80 now, I'd think, something like that. Best cutter I've ever seen anywhere. What, what he, made him really good, would you say? He, he just had it. He, he, he had it. You know what I mean? It, mm. Simon Cowell says, you know, you might be gorgeous, you might be fit, you might be this, you might be that, but you can't fucking sing. And the the the, the thing he's after is the singing. And mm. same with cutting and making, whatever. You've got to have that thing. I don't mm. know what it is, but it's mm. that thing. Mm -hmm. And Ray, whatever it was, he had it in spades. And he right. was good. He was really good. The problem with Ray is he was just so fucking militant. And I mean, mm. combative. I had a lot of run-ins with him. We nearly, we nearly literally toe-to-toe, nose-to-nose. 
mm. run-ins. So, but it was a good pal as well. I also boomed with him. We didn't hold a grudge. That's the thing in fact when you work with folk. You've got to let it go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he had it. He, oh, unbelievable. But he was just so knowledgeable. Mm. I, again, mm. and I just think it comes down to the quantity and being mm. that desire as well. You've got to have a desire to be good at what you do. You can be mm. half decent, but if you're only half decent, you're only giving it half, you're only half assed at it, aren't you? You've got a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah that's got, true. But there were some of the there were some of the cutters there that were not good, that were much older than Ray. Then I mean, bear in mind, you know, when I was sixteen, Ray was, you know, probably nearly forty. Right. So right. I was there fourteen years. I was there until I was twenty nine, actually, just before mm-hmm. I was thirty. Mm-hmm. There was a cutter there, Howard Broadhurst, that he'd served in the Second World War. He was garbage. Mm. Well, I say garbage. It was a good cutter, but it was so slow. It was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And it turns out he could never hit, he could never hit his target at my dad's factory, and he could never hit his target apparently at Burton's. But the thing is, he, he gets swallowed up in everybody else's work. It's always oh, not right. apparent. And it was one of those guys that you'd look at him all day and you think he's been busy all day, but when he couldn't hand his tickets in, he'd, he'd not done all hardly because he were always sort of moving slow and mincing about. Typical grey, slicked hair back, thin as a ray. He'd never changed, put an ounce on all his life from being bloody 15 year old. <laughs> but he, he was just always moving and graceful and that. But you'd look at it and what, what's Howard done? So you're always lifting, picking the slack up for others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There, I was really efficient. I could actually get my work done in three days, and it were a bugbear of mine. I used to get everybody else's shit that what they're not done. Efficient, uh, Des. I, I'd like to know what what made you what specifically made you efficient. Were you just uh, was it me- mentally, or just you had the skills, or were you quick? What was it? Well, you've got to have the skills firstly, but I'm just quick and quick and on the mark with it. I don't piss about. I'm brilliant at talking and working. Some people aren't. Mm-hmm. They can't talk and work. I can talk and work no problem at all. But if I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. If I'm if I'm going out for a run or I'm in that rowing machine, mm-hmm. I am I am on it, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that's what it is. I give it everything I've got. If I'm boozing, I'm boozing. I ain't coming home sober. I'm barrelic. <laughs> it's I'm committed. Yeah. That you've got to have skills to start with, but it was nothing to do to. I don't want to let my dad down or anything like that. I just couldn't do with bullshit and being bollocked. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, you'd, you'd go to the toilet in the factory and, you know, if you were more than like two minutes, bloody gaffer were coming in. Where are you? Come on, what are you doing? Right, it right. was bloody. Mm-hmm. You could smoke inside in them days. They'd let you smoke mm-hmm. if you were on job. And I used to smoke. So I'd be mm-hmm. smoking a fag on band knife. It'd be on edge of machine. And, <laughs> you know, fag on edge of machine. You know, so... Yeah. What it was, but I used to have some right run-ins with my boss, John Watson, again, who was a lovely man, very, very mm. good at what he did. And I really, re- looking back, I actually regret a lot of the shit I gave John because mm. he didn't deserve it. And But it was so soft. And I used to say, and of course, I, as I say, I was nobody. And I used to see what was going on. And, and John just, he didn't have the balls to brass him out. Ray, as I say, was so militant. Robin Hickling was the same, who was his mucker. Mm. And... John just, he didn't like conflict. So mm. I was like, why am I doing this when they haven't fucking done it? You ask them to do it. Why am I doing it? Because yeah. they knew I'd do it. They'd mm. go, no, I'm not doing it. It ain't my job. It really mm. was like that as well. So there were there was a lot of argy-bargy. Mm. But mm. The, for the whole, it was really good. But yeah. you've got... You've just got to get on with it. You know, when I'm mm-hmm. when I'm making something, I don't mess about. I get it all prepped. It's all done. So I do all my sewing in one go. I get all my cutting done in one go. I get all my sewing in one go. Then I do all my underpressing in one go. Then I go back and do whatever I've got to do. And so I, I really have that almost subdivision mentality mm-hmm. in my mm-hmm. head. Even though I'm dealing with ones and everything I do is full open coat and full bespoke. Yeah. It's as full bespoke as anybody's. Mm-hmm. There's more. There's people that put more hand work in, but hey, so what? Yeah, the, the, yeah. You know, as in, as in, unnecessarily. I'm not in the poor house at three thousand two hundred fifty, but you know, if somebody wants to charge eight grand and they've got a warranty and they've got to put another five hours of labour into it, have at it. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's always you can just go nuts with it. 
Yeah. But it's just been it's just been efficient, and I'm just very very efficient, and I've worked by myself for so long. Mm -hmm. And you can only let yourself down. And I suppose the other side of the coin is every client, I'm a boutique business. I am the proverbial one-man band. Mm -hmm. Granted, <coughs> excuse me, there are more of them now appearing that can do everything. Mm -hmm. But up until, I don't know, 15 years ago, there weren't many. There was probably only me, I reckon, that did everything, genuinely does, does everything. I mean, from drafting a pattern, mm -hmm. cutting it, cutting the cloth, doing the fitting, preparing it, making it, finishing it, pressing it, the lot in-house. Mm -hmm. I think it was probably only me. Granted, there's more people coming, which is good. So mm -hmm. you've got to get on with it. Every client is important when you're a micro business like me, when you're the one-man band that deals with the emails, that deals with the website, that deals with your social media. That's another thing I deal with. Nobody else does all that crap for me, Reza. I do it. Mm -hmm. It is a lot to get through. So you've got to, it, you know, when you're working, you're working. It's eyes down, look in. There's no point, as I say, pissing about it. The work is not going to roll to your door unless you've got a really nice place and a big fancy name and they're after this and they're after that. You've got to fight for every customer. And right. every customer, to get them, is important. You've got to hold on to them. So you've got to make sure your quality is good. And that all comes down to, to lots of things. But being efficient, anybody can be efficient if they want to be. Mm -hmm. You can't. You can never be efficient if you're working in a in a workroom that looks like a bloody alteration sh Turkish alteration shop in Berlin. Mm -hmm. You'll never you'll never turn all out if you're always rooming. Where's that? Where you know? Where's this? I oh, put it down. Where is it? You'll never be efficient. You're always mm -hmm. chasing your tail. What's point? Yeah, 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 yeah. What does it mean for you to be a craftsman? Well, it means everything to me. My name is everything. You've only two things in life. One's your word and the other's your name. And they're both very important to me. If I say to somebody, yeah, I'll be there at nine o'clock, I'll be there at ten to nine. Mm -hmm. I went out the other weekend on the piss with some lads in Birmingham, uh, tailors. And, mm -hmm. you know, I said, oh, I'm coming down, right? I was going to go see my cousin over in uh, Leicester. Mm -hmm. As I say, I picked this flip hold up. And because I'm on this autoimmune injection, seriously, it knocks hell out of me. But I'm really cautious. I keep people away from me. And it's still on me now, three weeks later. And Mrs. said, Des, you're not well enough to go. I went, listen, I said, I'm going down to Birmingham to go out on piss with these lads. The only way I ain't going is if I'm going out of this door in a body bag. Mm. That's the only way. So it means everything to me. That's my name and that's mm. my word. Mm. It means everything to me. Mm. You're a flea bag. If you can't keep your word and you trash your own name, you just flea bag. Mm. You're nothing else. If they don't mean anything to you, nothing does. Yeah, 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 yeah. So eventually, you, what what made the factory kind of like slowly fade away? Uh, this, the production just wasn't there. In um, So the factory closed in 1996, which is 25 years ago. And in those days, we were getting pinched on price. I say right. we, I just use the word as we. There'd yeah. actually been one round of redundancies Um couple of years prior to that because it was just too big the work wasn't there the volume mm -hmm. well it was there the price wasn't there to go with it and what was right. driving that price was in those days um spain and portugal were coming on board with starlight factories abroad for wholesale trade so they were driving the price down in the uk now it's very similar i presume with china and india and mauritius and other places just couldn't compete with those labor costs and there was a massive skill drain. So all the, and, you know, Poland was another place where factories were being established. So right. a lot of work was going overseas, the volume work. And bear in mind, you know, if you're going to work for a month, you know, we need 15,000 garments. Yeah. So if you're going to, you know, if, if, if you're going to work for a year, you know, you want a quarter million garments, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a lot of volume. Those orders yeah. just weren't there and as I say so you can imagine pennies on that price is a massive the massive massive incentive so they were just crushing the price more and more down so the factory just couldn't sustain it and I wasn't privy to the conversation but when the factory closed I went out with my father we, I can't remember where we went we went somewhere over Leeds with and I still saw my dad you know my mother was still alive my mother died within a month at factory closing which were another shit storm mm -hmm. um, 
And I went out with him and he told me the tale about when they actually went down to London. So they'd go down to London once a year to see the buyers. I can't remember if it was Burton's then, which would have been part of the um, Arcadia group. The Burton's factory is still open. It's Baird Menswear Brands. It's Peter Lucas. He's been head of that for years. I actually bumped into one of the old staff because I went to a Red Arrows thing with Ian Milligan from uh, Huddersfield Fine Worsteds and I bumped into one of the old girls actually who used to come to the factory, uh, mm. Jean Joyce. She used to be a trouser maker. Uh, mm. Sorry, dealt with trousers at the Gisborough factory. But anyway, I remember my dad telling me the tale. There was three of them when they started the factory. Eddie were dead within 12, 18 months and Eddie was the real driving force of that factory. Eddie was the former managing director, Eddie Topping. He was the former factory manager at Burton's in Doncaster. So he oversaw the whole factory. Mm. Then there was Janet Howard, who was the trouser room manageress. So she was very competent at trousers. They mm. actually established, I'll just give you a little bit of background. They mm. established the business of Topping Howard. Mm -hmm. And when they got going, but before they did anything, they realised, they thought, we, we actually need a third person. We, we're going to need somebody mechanically to deal with the machines. So this is Terry. Janet and Eddie had actually been made redundant from Burton's. My dad hadn't because my dad wasn't. My dad was plant and machinery, so he could have had a job until he retired if he wanted mm. to. So Janet and Eddie approached my dad and said, look, we're going out on our own. We've already established a business. We've got a unit in Doncaster. I think it was one of the first industrial units to get a grant from the EU or summer to help them get going. 5,000 mm. square feet, big open plant place. Mm -hmm. So my dad, my mum took her retirement from Burton's and my dad took his and between them I think they put 5,000 quid in and then the factory were done my dad never wanted his name on the board or anything outside but it was all on the paraphernalia because I remember him saying I don't care if my name's in lights on Broadway I know I own a third of this factory and that's good enough for me because that was weird because people used to turn up and think no oh, where's mechanic and went Terry then he'd jump he'd get out and jump in a 60 grand Merc you know what I mean like what's well he owns a third of factory Okay, now I only thought he was mechanic. No, he's one of the owners, mate. You know, mm, better be careful. Yeah. a bit of that as well if you're not careful. Yeah. So they went down to London as they did every year. Jan and Eddie were dead within 12, 18 months and the factory would have gone so much different. They were just looking at actually mm -hmm. going to start doing their own label stuff and selling their own stuff independently in their own shops. And mm -hmm. Eddie was the man to do that. So my dad and Janet sort of got thrown into the mix of having to deal with all business side of company, which mm -hmm. Eddie actually manager could do stood on his head mm. but changed the dynamic Janet was more upstairs and in the boardroom and my dad literally was then just downstairs but that suited him I think to be fair and he was getting paid a wedge mm. so every year they'd go down they went into London and they saw the buyers and the buyers said we'll fill the factory full of work this is words actually from my dad's mouth this is when the facts were done mm -hmm. they said to them we'll fill the factory full of work for the coming year but you've got to do it at last year's prices. So my dad and Anna just said to themselves, can we just have a minute, just have a natter? So they went and had a natter. Janet's sister, Sue, had just been found. She lived in Australia for many, many years. She'd been missing for months. She'd just been found in the outback. It turned out she'd crashed a car and she was dead. And she was, she was our fate with flies and maggots and shit. So they found her in the car. So Janet said, look, you know, they've just found Sue in the outback. I'm going to have to go to Australia and deal with all this shit, fall out of that. Mm. So she said, if you do it, you're going to be by yourself. And my dad just said to her, I think we've had a good run, don't you? Now, bear in mind, they owned everything they had. They owned everything they had within 12 months and the business grew. It went from 5,000 square feet to 25,000. They owned the buildings and everything. They owned, mm. the, the, they owned the buildings on the end that they leased out as well. Mm. They'd done really well. So my dad said, you know, I'm a kid from a council estate in Leeds. I think we've done pretty good, don't you? And Janet said, yeah, we don't need this, Terry. It's anymore. So they just went in and said, thanks, but no thanks. And they finished and it literally wore back quick. So mm -hmm. I got made redundant along with everybody else. The factory right. got sold one unit to a guy called Simon Yaff, which is Fairhaven Machinery that's still going. Mm -hmm. And it all went as a one, I believe, to Minsk in Russia. Mm -hmm. So that whole plant went to Russia, was just reset up. Right, right, right. That was right. it. I see, I see, I see. Hmm. So again, it was the whole price that was, you know, getting screwed and they wanted us to do it for no, and they went, we can't make money on it. You know, who can work for, 
Yeah. You can't if you're in business. You can only swallow it up for so long, and mm-hmm. suddenly it just you know you just you're hemorrhaging vast amounts of money. I don't know what the weekly wage will have been, but it'll have been a lot, and mm. the running costs and everything else. So there was like, no, we just we can't we can't do that. It's just bad business. So the candidate mm-hmm. said, we've done, we've yeah. done. From you know what I'm thinking is someone with your background and the stories you're you're telling me. What if you look at the tailoring industry now? What are the things that you, you that you see and you think, you know, this can be done better, or we're missing this? What do you think the tailoring industry needs the most at this given time? Well, I think you know UK manufacturing, you know, wholesale for the tailoring trade is absolutely dire. There was. Um, What's the name that bloody are now in Mauritius? It used to be in Norfolk. What they call the Mick for all London lot, don't they? Off the peg, I can't remember the name of them. Cheshire. The fact, no, no, not them. Bloody hell, it'll come to me in a minute. Wensum. Wensum. Right, you've got Wensum. They're now in Mauritius, aren't they? You've got the ones that are left. You've got the. I ain't going to name them because they're all shite. Because I've been in and I've seen them. They've all approached me because I know people that are in there and I've looked at them and I'm like. This is just crap, absolute crap. The, tr- the penny poor and pound foolish, they're trying to do something all on cheap. They're all trying to make a load of money really quick instead of building a really good product and then building a business off the back of that. And they're just all being the garbage. They're run by people that haven't got a clue what they're doing. And as I say, I've been in these factories within the last couple of years, incidentally, this is not hot air. I've been in and seen it. I've actually gave them a couple of samples. I'm like, Pfft. I've took the horn buttons off and thrown them in the bin. That shit. Mm. So, but I've told them. I've told them so. And the other aspect is they won't listen. They're no better than you. Mm. Their cat, their cat's blacker than your cat. Don't matter what you say to them. They've got this thingy about them. But the thing is, they're serving such a low end of the market, the tailoring mm. market. Which brings me on to all these dreamboat tailors that are not tailors. They're all con man frauds and liars, in my opinion. Mm. And it's akin to the army and stolen valor and all that shit. The border on mis-selling the goods act. Why people don't suss them out? It, it frustrates their life out of me. Mm. But they just don't have the quality. They just don't have the will to have the quality. Mm-hmm. They don't have the skills. And I don't think they want to pay for it. You know, some of them have said to me, will you come in? And I'm like, yeah, I'll come in. And that's my day rate. That's what it's going to cost you. And they just, oh, no, it's too expensive. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, if you paid me that for a week, I could get you a product that's really amazing, that would flow down your production line a lot simpler. Mm. And you'd have you'd have a unique product made in the UK. And they can't see it. Mm. And to be honest, I couldn't give a fuck whether I do it or not. I don't need the money for it. Mm-hmm. But I'd like to see somebody prosper and do it. Lawrence yeah. Robinson, who I were out with the other week, he said, fucking hell, he said, I didn't realise you knew so much about garments and engineered garments and cutting. I went, well, I don't think I do. But he mm. said, fucking hell, you do. He said, I don't know anybody that knows what you know. He says, why don't you do it? I says, because I don't want the shit, Lawrence. Why do I want the shit? I'm making ones at the moment. I did with one client. I do what I want. I come and go as I please. I make a few quid. I'm happy. I don't want all that crap of running a plant and that. I've had it when I was a trade maker. I had 13 right. staff and I couldn't get to sleep on a night. Because when you have staff, it's always like you're chasing work. You've got to fill it. Yeah. And the politics of people managing. I can manage people, no problem. But the way I talk to people, they don't like it because I say it as it is. It's there's, yeah. there's, there's it's a line. You know, you can take a look to that line as much as you want, but if you step over it, I'm a different person. And mm-hmm. people are the soft. They don't they don't like the truth. Mm-hmm. It's all sounds you know, very convoluted, but that's how I see life. I see it pretty black and white, as I say. I suppose it comes back to really old values of, of I value my name and my reputation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you're relying on other people to keep that going, mm-hmm. they've got to meet the standard. If they do jog yeah. on. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we need, we really need, as I say, there's people that are having a go at it, but they're never going to succeed to any kind of standard. And mm. they're not, A, they're not charging enough. B, the product is not good enough. Mm. C, the people they're dealing with are all these fake tailors, I call them, which haven't got a clue and they want all these weird style, crappy things. That's fine. Mm. There's nothing wrong with that. But if your foundations are shite, mm-hmm. it don't make the difference if you've got, you know, an angle cuff and a different coloured button hole and a different lapel hole and two lapel holes. Mm. They're irrelevant. If the actual garment is shit, yeah, you know, 
but the people they're selling to can't see beyond it's oh it's got a red button or that, that's <laughs> that's their market that's mm. their market that, oh, it's got a pink lining you know yeah, look at this yeah. that's yeah, their yeah. market resin the welcome to it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, let's let's do a speed round. I've got a few words. I'd like to know the first thing that pops up your mind uh, mm. when hearing these words. So, the first one is discipline. For me or for you? Well, Bear in mind, about... I, have three, I have three stripes on my arm, so I'm pretty good at dishing it out. I can also take it, though. <laughs> well, both of them. How about discipline for me? Well, you've got to do as you're told. You know, I mean, I won't have people, you know, I'm, I'm open to suggestion and I'm open to people expanding my mind, but don't insult me intelligence. I had it other weekend down in Birmingham with some complete muppet and in the end that, that Lawrence had brought with him. And in the end, I went to him, look, you and me need to go outside for a chat. You've been needling me on all night and he won't go outside for a chat. I said, it'll be over in a flash, mate. He says, but you've been needling me all night. He, he knew, you know, what I knew you could put on a postage stamp and what I didn't you could fill a fucking library with. I can't be doing yeah. with people like that. It's akin yeah. to me yeah. reading the Haynes manual on my BMW and suddenly I'm a BMW engineer. No, yeah. I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, all right. Marriage. Marriage? Yeah. I love marriage. My my wife now, my one and only wife, Sarah, love it. Amazing person. She completes me, kid, seriously. Right. Great stuff. Um, factory work. I love factory work. It's mm. got to be decent, though. Now then, I wouldn't like to be in a factory lugging bags of coal around, yeah. but factory work, I love it. Camaraderie, the crack, the smell, the noise, the mm. hub hub, the chit chat, the backstabbing, the bitching, the arguments, the affairs. Brilliant. Bring it on. Mm. All right, all right. Family business. Family business, don't do it. Mm. don't do it I worked for my father I found it very difficult I had my oldest son for a year before he joined the army I found mm. it difficult I tried him again when he came back and it caused a little bit of conflict because mm. at that point the business has changed if I wanted to go home at 2 o'clock he wanted to go home at 2 o'clock and I'm like no, not happening you're salaried I can do what I want so yeah. I would say don't do it it's difficult alright, alright okay um, Peter Quirk Oh, Peter, bless him. I, I, he's probably dead, I think. I think I heard on Great Man a few years ago, he's dead. Peter Quirk, loved him. His tales were amazing. I think some of them were a little long in the <laughs> tooth, but amazing. Yeah, a lot of time for him. Loved him, loved him mm. dearly, dearly. All right. Very, All right. very sad when some twat at college nicked his 1928 set of the modern tailor outfitter and clothier. I was right. really good that somebody pinched that set of books that he had, mm. that he had there for everybody to look at. And some mm. flea bag nicked. And I really felt for Peter with that because I, I actually want to ask the Adam and he said to me, do you book the books about that? I went, yeah, Peter, yeah, put back in the cupboard. So they'll have gone. I went, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah, but Peter loved him, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what makes a good cutter? What makes a good cutter? Well, you've got to be able to cut for a start, have not you? Yeah, that that help. I think you've got to have a fair eye for cutting, but I don't. As I say, I don't put that much on cutting. There's a lot said about it. There's a very old phrase: the best cutter that exists now, that has ever existed and is yet to exist, can be had in the pocket of any tailor because without him, he's powerless. Right, 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 right. That's very interesting to hear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, the army. Oh, loved it. My little experience with it, loved it. Still hanker for it, but in many days I don't think about it. A lot of my mates have done it. My son was there. When I'm with my son, it's army talk. Love it. I love that mm -hmm. crack, that camaraderie, that getting stuck in, being yeah. knackered, being freezing cold, being boiling hot, being mm. pissed, being shouted at bollocking people, running them around, giving them a press-ups, loved it. Yeah. The other day, I'd have been far better soldier than Taylor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how would you define quality? Well, quality is in the eye of the beholder. You can't define it. It's whatever mm -hmm. you perceive it to be, mm -hmm. you know. 
a Timex watch is a Timex watch. A Rolex is a Rolex. Ultimately, they're both a watch, but they're not. They're a really different product. Yeah, it's like comparing yeah. both. Bentley, they're both a car, but they're not. Mm. They're a different product, but they're both a car. To some people, they're both a car. So mm-hmm. quality can't be defined. It's in the eye of the beholder. Right, right. So incidentally, uh, incidentally, I possess a Rolex and a Timex, and my 20 quid Timex keeps better time than my Rolex. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Savile Row. Uh, tragic, as it stands tragic. at the moment. Yeah, tragic. I really do. It's the heartland of British tailoring. Do they possess the best skills? No, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they've been their own worst enemy mm-hmm. for many, many years, keeping it closed, being so um, institutionalised with it almost, not wanting to share bitter rivalries. What's mm-hmm. the point of that? It's worth nothing when it's in ground with whoever worked there. Mm-hmm. Pass it out a bit. You know what I mean? You don't have to give the keys to the kingdom away, but give yeah. it away a bit. You seem to have this, mm-hmm. you know, this us mentality. And yeah. I've never I've got that. I'm not saying I give everything away to people, but if somebody asks me something, I'll tell them more than often. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to start doing, you know, online lecturing for free or all like that. You know, I, as I say, why should I? So I think it's a real shame, a real shame. And also really disappointing. I went for a job down there at Henry Pools. I went with a day trip uh, when I was at college and Peter went with us. And actually, we walked in one of the little rooms upstairs and one of Peter's former guys was in there coat making. So he went, oh, Mr. Quirk, how are you? And Peter didn't remember him. He was like, oh, and he went, oh yes, yes, whatever his name was. And so I thought, I loved it. I thought this, oh, wow, you know, the impressive busts and all these royal warrants and what have you, various dictators, Napoleon and stuff. And mm-hmm. I thought, right, I'll apply for a job. So I wrote a letter down. And I got a very nice, nice letter back on their headed, three embossed logos, mm-hmm. Napoleon, someone, all dead, as I say, dictators and tin pot, despots, Philip Parker. And uh, I got an interview to go down and see him, <clears throat> which I did. My brother lived in Maud and it was just before Christmas, many, many years ago. Mm-hmm. And I rocked up Reza and it was like Helmut Marie Celeste for a start. There was hardly anybody in there. And then I got to the thingy and I said, I've got an appointment with Philip Parker. She buzzed off. She came back. She went, oh, Mr. Parker's forgot you were coming. Well, my face were like fucking thunder. It must have been. I've come mm-hmm. all the way down from Yorkshire, 250 mile to come here. And this prick has forgot I'm coming down. I thought, how pompous are you? Mm. So then he turned up, he questioned me a little bit. Well, you obviously know a little bit, blah, blah, blah. And he just whazzed me downstairs to three old trouser makers who I had a great time with. Spent about an hour there and I pissed off and I thought, is that it? That's it. This bell end forgot I were coming. Mm. How pompous is that? Right, right, right. Okay, so I have one more and that will be the last one. And that's Desmond Barrier. you. I'm not going to tell you where it deeds to me gold mine is. <laughs> <coughs> no, that's fine. No, that's fine. The last one is Desmond Marion. Um, a storm in any port, honestly. It's, I, I can flip like the weather just really, mm. really quick. Mm. But overall, if folk are all right with me, I'm all right with them. Mm. I'm, I don't suffer fools gladly. I'm not one of them that goes out and feels I need to express my opinion on them to any, anybody. Mm-hmm. But if you ask me opinion, don't be offended when I gave, give you it. You ask my opinion. Yeah. I'm not going to show you it. If you're a prick, you're a prick. And I'm yeah. going to tell you. So it's what yeah. it is. But, you know, more often than not, I get on with most folk. But a lot of people are intimidated with me. I mean, mm. you know, I'm 16 and a half stone. I'm 5'9". I'm fairly trim with it. And it's been the same all my life. I've tattoos all over it. It's a stereotype. But they're assessing me. I'm not assessing them. Mm. But more often than not, I'm, I'm fine. But, yeah, and just just get on with it. Just just do your best. Yeah, but yeah. I give myself a hard time sometimes. Maybe I shouldn't, mm. particularly with work. As I say, you're always chasing that last. Yeah. You're trying yeah. to... And at them, and you're not going to do it. It's just, mm. there's always, as I say, there's always summer. Just give yourself a break. You've got to be a realist. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've definitely enjoyed this conversation, and you're Good. you're exact oh. you're ex- you're exactly the no nonsense person I expected you to be. So that's that was good. 
Well, that's nice to know. It's been really nice talking to you. Hopefully I haven't swore too much, but I can only speak as I sort of see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's no, fine, man. There's no point sugarcoating it. You know, that's that's how I talk. I don't swear with clients unless they swear with me. If they start <laughs> swearing with me, then I will swear. But until they swear, that door yeah. is shut. Mm-hmm. But once they open it, boom, <laughs> then I'm away. But the one thing I am, Reza, is... Is, is I'm the same with everybody, no matter who you are. Mm. I mean, I have clients, I have clients that built Meadowall, mm. the multi-billionaires, have, mm. you know, the CEO of m Investments, Prudential, yeah. shit like that. I'm yeah. the same with them I am with you. Mm. And that's why I think I've been all right, because yeah. people see through you. Nobody wants mm. some shallow twat mm. that's mm. sick and panty can blow smoke up your ass. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, you, if you want that, don't come and see me because you won't mm. get it. Yeah, I'll have a conversation, yeah. but you won't get that at all. Mm. But you don't need to be brutally honest and break somebody with words either. It's a very mm. fine balance. Yeah, and you yeah, can. That's very well said. Yeah, you can yeah. break somebody with words, so you've got to be careful. So I, mm. I cannot. Again, I was always told by my father, a still tongue is a wise tongue. So sometimes I have quite a still tongue. Mm. But that bell end last weekend, he pushed me and he. He, well, he was lucky. I, I bet a part of Valerie walked away. So, <laughs> lucky no, that's him. fine. Thank you, Des. Thank you no so worries. much for this interview. And uh, well, I look forward to uh, perhaps meet up some some point when we have less restrictions and uh, yeah, uh, easier no travel. And that was Desmond. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. I hope not many people were offended. And uh, if you did like videos like this or conversations like this then we have a few more so you could watch the previous conversations i've had uh with some of the tailors that you may have seen on instagram or on the internet and if you like what we are putting out then please support us by subscribing to this channel we've got some exciting things coming up and uh yeah if you uh, like to see more from desmond you can follow the links to his instagram and website in the description of this video And uh, as always, I'd like to know your thoughts, your opinions, your insights. So if you have any, please drop them down in the comment section. And I hope to see you again in the next episode. Until then, bye-bye.